So I wanted to start with um, the first slide that describes the conception of the F score and give you a little process for how we applied it and what our rationale was for coming up with the reason why the F score was needed. At first, when we first saw the iOS store and the Google Play store just growing exponentially every day, every month, the number of new apps being added, we were seeing a really big discovery problem. And while this is most apparent on the consumer side, with users really having a hard time browsing and discovering apps that they might like past the top 100, we were also seeing it you know, on the flip side of the developer and on the platform side. So developers who just didn't have the big marketing budgets to make it to that top 100 just really weren't seeing any downloads. And on the flip side, stores and platforms interested in featuring or recruiting developers to their new stores just weren't able to, to identify anything in mass. And so what we came up with was an algorithm that solves all of the publicly available data on Google Play, iOS, and a couple other platforms. And we created a machine learning algorithm with the goal of scoring every app on a scale of 1 to 10. And this is basically our quality index for the app. Um, and before I go on to the next slide, I wanted to talk about sort of our um, thinking and how we got to where we are. So first we started with, okay, well, let's just base every app quality on the Google Play ranking. So there are a lot of lists, and you know the top ones, like Angry Birds, are obviously the highest quality, and you just go down from there, right? Well, it's not that simple, because most major platforms only rank the first 1,000 apps in your category. So you have maybe hundreds of thousands of apps that are never even discovered and never ranked that nobody knows about. And then we started with, OK, how about the number of downloads? And we'll just sort that. But that doesn't work either because then you have to take into account the star reviews um, and the ratings that the apps are actually getting. And then if you start look, um, thinking about relevancy, are the right users reviewing the app? What are they saying? And so pretty soon what we ended up with was a very complicated machine learning model that just started looking at lots and lots of features about apps. And what we try to do is we, for every crawl of the store that we do, we take a current snapshot of the app. And that snapshot looks at a variety of features from the merchandise appeal, which is how well is the app marketed to consumers? Is the description complete? Is the screenshot all there? I mean, they're all very basic things that really influence the customer's purchase decision. And then after that, we look at the user feedback that the app is getting. And of course, in order to uncover the apps that aren't in the top 100, we can't just rely on volume. So then we have to apply a qualitative analysis, which is a sentiment analysis on the user reviews to see what the users are doing. So for every app, every app review that has a standard five-star rating, we take that and we deconstruct the review to see is it a bug report that's disguised as a review? Is it a really raving one, not all five stars are created equal? And then we adjust that on a scale of one to 10 to give us a more nuanced picture, which gives us um, which, put, which gives us um, what we call the true rating of the app. Then we look at the relevancy of the app, which is the traction that it's been getting over time. Is it growing virally? Is it growing steadily, but continually? And how is the developer maintaining the app and interacting with it to come up with? And we put all this into a machine learning model. And looking at snapshots at any given time period, we compare the success with how well the app is doing 30 days from that point on to so that our model is currently refining itself and getting smarter with every new iteration of data that we input into it. And so currently, this is we've scored the HTML5 apps across the Chrome Web Store, the Firefox um, OS, and the Android apps across Google Play. And these are the results of the app, the number of apps that we've scored in our system and the number of qualifying apps, which we define as apps scoring 8.5 or higher on a scale of 1 to 10. And as you can see, the success rate is very low, especially for HTML5 apps. The success rate in this case is defined as qualifying apps? Yes, yeah. the, the percentage, percentage of qualifying, of qualifying apps, apps in the entire store, exactly. And so I wanted to touch upon, when we started out with the sentiment analysis, I wanted to touch upon some new projects that we're working on to help improve the app score. So the, to explain a little bit, um, the most complicated and I would say most powerful part of our algorithm is how we're able to analyze each individual reviews and qualify what the user is saying. 
And that, we do that in a variety of steps. One is through just a basic keyword filter. So very strong, connotative, emotional words that users use to review how they're feeling. And then the second piece of it is isolating specific user-specific experiences, so from bug reports to um, to reports of things that worked very well for that user, but that we didn't think really qualified as a general evaluation of the app. Now, the real problem in that, and something that we've been working on, which smartly touches upon, is the language of, is the issue of language. So, even though, the, so while the, as we're going into a more globalized world and the apps themselves have become more localized, what you're seeing is an attraction of users globally across multiple different languages using the same app. And of course, we can't expect them all to review the app in English. And so right now, we've been able to analyze the reviews that are in English using some very um, standard natural language processing and as I said, keyword filtering. But once we start throwing in um, the different languages, we start struggling a bit because our first sort of approach the problem was try to reduce it back to something we've already solved by translating everything into English. But as you can see, these are direct translations using a you know leading translation engine, and you can see it ranges from broken English to close to gibberish. And at this point, the entire algorithm <laughs> falls apart. Are you using your own um, NLP engine, or are you licensing one? We're using our own. So you're building your own ontologies and dictionaries for all of it in the back end? Yes. Do you do a lot with kind of, I used to call it the snarkiness problem, which is things like people saying, it was a great app, not right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we struggle a bit with the snarkiness just because sarcasm is hard to detect, but a lot of that is reflected. <laughs> A lot of that is reflected in the ultimate star review. So, you know, someone who says it's a great app, not normally it's not a five star review. So, we just try to correlate the two to guess at the true meaning of what the user is trying to say. But obviously, once you get into here, I mean, the hardest part, I think, is because on an automated basis and the volumes that we're dealing with, not only is it hard to qualify, not only is this hard to analyze this within an algorithm, it's hard to tell if the quality of the translation is correct, because unless you're a natural language speaker, for all I know, this could be the actual translations of the reviews from before, and the translation engine is doing a great job, and it just doesn't convert to English well. But we're exploring um, solutions to come up with a cost-effective, accurate, and most importantly, efficient way of translating all of these reviews, because as I mentioned, we're dealing with everything in very, very large volumes. And while a, um, a manual review could definitely show the problems with this, it's not something that we'd be able to detect on an automated basis. And the second issue that project that we've been working on to um, better the app score is really to start looking at user information. So what we have right now in the Google Play Store is just a collection of reviews from users that might as well be anonymized. You get a username, but any other information about that user is lost from even the age, the gender, to even other apps that the user has reviewed. That information is not available within the Google Play Store. So the approach that we've taken is working backward almost by focusing on specific apps and then seeing if we can find references to that app across popular social networks such as Facebook, Twitter, and uh, my cat here, Tumblr. And based on references here, we'd be able to trace it back to the original person who's referring to that app and whether he likes it or doesn't like it and use that to really um, come up with a social graph of who is actually using the apps. Because I know, I think a, a year back, it was very interesting when Zynga released the report that says Farmville, which is the most popular game on Facebook, was actually most popular among women, middle-aged women, ages 30 to 40, which was very different from what anyone else was expecting at the time. And so I think this information becomes extremely valuable for developers who really don't know what kind of users are using them and how to um, iterate upon their game and improve upon it to really capture the audiences or maybe to um, expand their game a little bit to appeal to a wider audience. Quick question. I mean, there's a lot of debate, in particular thinking about segmentation or even micro-segmentation whether demographics is really that interesting at the end of the day because usage-based is much more 
sort of up to date in terms of behaviors. And demographics obviously doesn't capture everything at the end of the day because people might be of a certain gender, certain you know race, but they live in a certain town with other people around them, etc. How, how do you guys think about that? You know, usage segmentation versus demo segmentation, the relevance of demographics. I definitely think there's a danger in relying purely on segmentation as a whole and really segregating. So if I was Farmville and seeing that my app only appealed to women ages 40, to really fine tune your app to only appeal to that group is very dangerous. I feel like it does become very, very important when you use it as part of a comprehensive picture of how your app is doing. So being able to appeal to the right audience and making sure that you're not turning away any specific audiences really allows you to optimize your game. So this is a then finally um, an overview of the app that grabs for it and the, really the main features that we're looking at. And we do that through a combination of all of, it's all publicly available data at this point because we feel that that's the way that's the best way to evaluate all of the games in volume. When we start relying on information that requires developer opt-in, we only get a subset of that, and our analysis might become a bit biased based on self-selection. So what we get is, what we focus on is, as I mentioned, the user reviews to get at the sentiment analysis and the feedback of the app, um, the social graph to start segregating all of it, and then some in-app analysis. And right now, we do a proxy for in-app analysis based on what users were saying about the reviews. So rather than having access to a Flurry SDK that actually shows average session lengths and where user drop-off is highest, we try to capture that through the user reviews as a proxy. So as I mentioned before, we filter out all of the bug reports. And then once you start um, aggregating them, you can really see some common trends to what they're complaining about. So for example, the the new Angry Birds on iOS, on Google Play, there's a lot of complaints about ads within the free version. And that is actually hurting the app a lot more than it should. And it's something very basic. Um, but at the same time, if Angry Birds is able to monetize really well off of those ad revenue, despite the negative user reviews, it might be worth it. But we feel that it's very important to surface all of this information to educate the developers so they know at least the actions that they're taking with inside the app and how it's ultimately affecting what the user is saying, which then ultimately affects how their app performs on the store. And so um, now we're going to cover two examples of how the app store is currently used by our partners to help with um, distribution and also with um, recruitment. So on one hand, we work with a lot of peer networks or companies with future platforms that are interested in not exactly recruiting the app to their platform, but really just featuring, finding apps to feature, to recommend to their user base, and which links back to Google Play. So here, our, our app store algorithm provides sort of an easy method for them to curate through all of the apps that are available in the store and recommend some that may not be in the top 100 because they don't want to create just a subset of a top 100 list, but that would really, that are unknown, but that would really delight and um, entertain their users. And the second way is through um, integration with cross-platform tools that allow us to um, help new platforms such as Kaizen, which is one of our main clients, um, help them to better target and really effectively recruit developers. So here what we do is through integration with cross-platform tools, we're able to score the developer's project while he's creating it, while he's building it, um, on a scale of 1 to 10. And based on that score, provide a relative incentive offer from uh, platforms that are interested. And you'll see here the amounts of money that they're offering are not very large, but it's enough to get to it's get out of bed money that's enough to help the developer make that decision to port. Because our assumption is when a developer is using one of these tools, the technical barrier to converting to a new platform is removed. And really the only issue that's preventing that conversion is worry about the platform itself, that it that it won't monetize, and then worry about um, the maintenance of the app on a very, it's all very logistical. 
And so we feel that presenting a small amount of money right on the stage when he's making that decision of courting becomes then extremely powerful.